Let me just so make sure that you can see me on the phone there. Um, yeah, you're both there, but you are center and Dr. Dixon is side. Okay, so, you can just turn it slightly. Oh, on the head? Yeah, because you see he's like the frame. Yeah. It's a bit, yeah, right away. It's a little crooked. Yeah. Okay, well that's as good as we're going to get unless we... Okay, yeah, that's okay. There, that's better. Okay, because I don't need to see you. Yeah, we're not crooked now. Okay. Well, you could probably put those away. Yeah, so I'm going to. Show on the I'm going to. Screen. <clears throat> this over. Okay, everybody, if you are tuning in with us, we are here on our live Facebook um discussion with Dr. Bob Dixon. I'm so happy to be here talking to him today. Uh, if you don't know, we are here because uh, Calgary is presently considering putting fluoride back in our water. And this is something that's very important for all Calgarians to understand and really know all the details about. So I wanted to do an interview with Dr. Bob today so that we can tell you all the information, you can gather information so that you know if you think this is a good choice for your family and your health and your pocketbook and all of those things. So we're gonna dive deep into the world of water and fluoride with Dr. Bob today. And if you have questions, please make sure that you post them uh, in the comments section and we will make sure that we get to those questions and get them answered. If we don't have time to do it live, we will certainly make sure we scroll back through and answer your questions uh, afterwards, after the post goes up. And we're gonna have links coming up for you in the comments sections, links where you can find more information, links where you can take action uh, if you are so inclined to do so. Uh, so, without further ado, let's hop on and introduce Dr. Bob Dixon. Uh, he is a licensed family doctor here in Calgary, licensed in Alberta, and he is the guy behind Safe Water Calgary and has been really involved uh, in helping us uh, with this initiative and was super involved back in 2011 when we took fluoride out of the water. So, first of all, Dr. Bob, I'd like to ask you what got you so passionate about this particular subject? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a long story. It's about a two-decade story, actually. Okay. And uh, it goes back to 1998 when we had our last referendum in Calgary on water fluoridation, or plebiscite as some people call it. Mm -hmm. We've had five so far. The first three defeated it in the 60s and 70s. And then in 1989, it passed. Fluoride fluoridation passed, and we started fluoridating in 1991. But a lot of people still protested. So in 1998, uh, the city of Calgary put together a so-called expert panel, which was basically a lot of pro-fluoridationists from the University of Calgary, and had another plebiscite. And um, they spent a lot of money advertising, uh, I guess you could call it propaganda, because a lot of the things weren't maybe quite totally true. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as a busy family doctor, I don't have time to research and look into all the 5,000 different things I have to deal with on a regular basis. So I voted for water fluoridation, trusting the experts. Right. And after the plebiscite, which passed, I think it was 54 to 46 percent okay. uh, in favor of water fluoridation, mm -hmm. um, people came to me and said, well, why did you vote for it? I thought you were like a progressive family doctor. And I went, well, I haven't really looked at all the information, but I trusted the experts. And they said, well, you should look at the information. So I did. Mm -hmm. And a couple of weeks later, I just, I remember saying to myself, oh my God, we've really blown it on this one. Mm -hmm. This is something that should not be in public water. It should not be public health policy. So, um, you want the rest of the short story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great, that's a great start. So then you started, you know, really digging into the research and figured yes. out, whoa, hold the phone here. And I took it to my uh, good friend, Dr. Jim Beck, who is one of my mentors at the University of Calgary Medical School. He has a PhD and an MD. Uh, he's a biophysicist and an MD. And I took it to him and I said, Jim, would you mind looking at this? And he says, no problem. And uh, so he looked at it and a couple of weeks later, he came back and said exactly the same thing. Wow. What are we doing? Wow. And he, Jim said at that time, well, um, maybe we should do something about it. And they said, okay, you'll help me with this. And he goes, absolutely. He said, we should be done in a few months. Well, um, 12, 13 years later, later, we finally got the taps turned off in 2011. Wow. Wow. So that's one of my questions for you. 
Um, I just want to check in quickly though with our behind the scenes tech person. Are we good? We're showing? Everything's okay back there? Good. Okay. So why did they decide then? Why did council decide back in 2011 that they were going to take the fluoride out of the water? Well, councillors are not scientists. They're not meant right. to be scientists. Most of them are not trained as scientists. Um, but they do have a background in making moral and ethical uh, decisions that are important to their constituents. Okay. And so they, they uh, had piles of evidence on both sides, scientific studies from us, scientific studies from the prochloride side. And so it was really quite confusing for them. Um, but they could make that decision on the morals and ethicality of mass medicating everybody in their constituency mm. without control of dose and dosage we can get into that a bit more later yeah. and without any following or monitoring any follow-up or monitoring and uh, so they made that decision based on the morals and ethics of fluoridation also on the uh, economics of it as well okay interesting so the moral side of mass medicating can you can you explain what you mean by the moral and ethical side of mass medicating and, and how how fluoride in the water? Because most people wouldn't think of fluoride in the water as mass medication. So tell us about that. Well, fluoride is uh, technically, and according to a number of the scientific agencies in the United States, a medication because you're using it to prevent a disease, which is dental caries. Right. So it's it's not a nutrient. Um, it's not a med. Uh, it's not a, um, uh, a, a vitamin. It's not a supplement. It's not certified under any of those categories. It's not categorized or certified under a food. Mm -hmm. So um, what is it? Well, it's one of the most toxic elements on the planet. And it's, um, uh, it's um, just put into our water to decrease caries and cavities, supposedly. Okay. So, um, so it doesn't fit in the context of nutrient or mineral or uh, vitamin or anything the body really needs in particular, so it's sort of, exactly. in, they use it in dental offices in sort of a, a medical type of right. way, so this is why we talk about it as medical, medicating people on a mass level, and as you say, mm. not being able to track really the consequences right. of that exactly. mass medication, and that's a concern. Yeah. yeah, so it certainly is a medication in that sense, and it's been, the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1950s deemed it to be a medicine, okay. and uh, that's never been refuted, so... Uh, I mean, what else can you call it? You're using right. it to treat uh, a medical problem. Right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that brings up the issue of the cavities. And I know that that is one of the arguments being put forward at the moment is mm -hmm. that since they took it out of the water, that childhood cavities have increased. And that's one of the main arguments for bringing it back in is, is mm -hmm. the poor kids, you know, we need to make sure their, their teeth are taken care of. So, mm -hmm. you know, What's going on there? What's the truth of that situation? Well, we absolutely have to make sure that the, the poor kids are taken care of and their dental health is very important. It's an important part of their overall health. But um, we've been misled by the pro-fluoridationists and by the press as well, unfortunately. We may as well now get into the, the infamous study by Dr. Lindsay McLaren from 2000, February of 2016. And in that study, it showed that um, cavities and caries in Calgary's kids and in Edmonton's kids, Edmonton's been fluoridated since 1967 and still is, uh, cavities and caries were increasing in both those cities. Mm. Um, Calgary had started at a slightly lower rate than Edmonton, but they both met um, around 2009-2010 uh, and then leveled off to about the same, uh, the same amount uh, when the study finished in 2014. So it was a 10 year study mm -hmm. comparing a lot of Edmonton kids to a fewer a number of Calgary kids. And so immediately, uh, within a day or two, there was literally hundreds of articles in the Canadian and some even international press saying that Calgary's kids' caries have increased uh, since ending water fluoridation and that some were saying that we have an epidemic of caries and kids' teeth are falling out of their heads mm -hmm. and, and it's all due to ending fluoridation. If you ask Dr. McLaren herself, she will admit to you that her study does not show that. It does show an increase in caries in Calgary's kids during the time Calgary was fluoridated, mm -hmm. which was most of that part of the study, and, and after as well. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the study, there is literally no difference, no statistical yeah. um, evidence that, um, that there is a difference between Calgary and, 
Edmonton's kids' teeth. Uh, mm -hmm. The permanent teeth in Calgary's kids were actually slightly better than Edmonton's, mm -hmm. and the, um, the primary or baby teeth in, in Calgary's kids were slightly worse than Edmonton's. But anyway, statistically, there was really no difference there. Wow. Well, that's interesting to actually, you know, have somebody look at the, the numbers and the statistics on the study rather than just the sensationalized... Exactly. But to this day, Deborah, they, uh, every press article you'll see will quote that. Yeah. The study from 2016 showed that Calgary's kids' teeth are a lot worse than Edmonton's, and some say it's like a huge amount worse, and some say it's significantly worse, whatever. But every single article you'll see in the press, in the Canadian press, will say that, and it's not true. true. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So when people could confirm that themselves, really, couldn't they just by looking at the study? You have to read the study, the study and, and, uh, yeah. and also you can read um, in that same journal that the study was printed in, uh, there's a group of seven um, toxicologists, MDs, dentists, researchers that put a refutation uh, of that study, of the McLaren study, into the same journal a few months later. So that's available too, and we can also send anybody a link on that. Okay. It's a very good refutation of that study and showing a lot of the links, or the, the holes, the problems, um, the misleading parts of that study, or just where it was inaccurate. Right, that's great, and I love that idea. So we'll post some of those links in the comments later because I know you know there are some people that, that like to dig into the research and they like mm -hmm. to look into you know the information that's really there, uh, and, and that's great. So we encourage everybody to do that and get as informed as you can. Uh, so you know, let's go back to the, the kids' cavities part and the fact that um, Putting, okay, so hmm, do I want to ask you, which question do I want to ask you first? Is putting fluoride into the water the most effective way, if, let's just say that fluoride was needed for the cavities, is mm -hmm. putting it in the water the most effective way of getting it into our kids' teeth? Well, first of all, you have to say that fluoride is not needed for a single body function. It's not needed for anything in the body. Uh, vitamin D that we put in milk, um, sometimes we uh, put things in salt like iodine or um, other supplements, those are all essential for, for body right. for body needs, for body function. And teeth. Um, and teeth, yeah, vitamin D is, is big for teeth. Um, but fluoride is not needed for a single body function, so um, right there, it shouldn't be added to water. Right. Um, nothing should be added to water because we have some of the best water on the planet, and so yeah. adding anything to the water is, I think, uh, a bit of a crime. But yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it's not needed for any body function, so right there. Should not be added. What would be the point? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Fluoride. And so, and you're asking about cavities then? Yeah. So you know, is it really effective to be putting it in the water? If, that, mm -hmm. if the reason, if the argument is, you know, they're still going to stick to their guns on this study and say, you know, the cavities mm -hmm. have increased, and the argument is fluoride in the water is going to help that. Is that? actually the most effective yeah. way to be doing it? So uh, that's a really good question because there's so many other ways to get your fluoride. Right. And that also gives people choice. If you put it in the water, people don't have choice. Everybody gets it in their tap water, they get it when they bath and shower, they, they get it when they cook. Uh, it's, it's really ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you, um, um, so if you use varnishes, gels, toothpaste, um, then go to the dentist and get your treatments there. You can even use fluoride pills if you want to have fluoride. But there's so many ways to deliver it much more efficiently and much more effectively if you want fluoride. Putting it in the water, 99% of the water is not drank. Mm. So 99% of the water that has this medication in it goes to water your lawn, to wash your car, to flush your toilet. Um, and then it goes back into the environment unchecked. Right. So there's and an environmental concern. Exactly, and there are some studies coming out now that show that anything above uh, 0 0.5 parts per million is, is not good for the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good time to touch on what's actually put in water that's fluoridated, like in Edmonton and Toronto, yeah. for instance. Sure. It's actually not pharmaceutical grade sodium mm -hmm. fluoride, it's a hydrofluorosilicic acid which is um, a toxic waste product that's scrubbed out of the fertilizer industry st stacks in the southern states, and now most of it actually comes from China. Mm -hmm. And that hydrofluorosilicic acid is not allowed by strict law to be put into the air, put into the ground, or into any water like oceans, rivers, lakes, streams. Wow. By strict law, they would have to dispose of it in toxic disposable plants, which would cost the industry about $6,000 a ton to dispose of. 
because it's highly toxic and volatile right. and hard to dispose of. Instead, they've convinced us that it's good for our kids' teeth and they put it in our water and get $1,000 a ton from us right. to dump so it in, to dispose of it in our water. Pay to dispose of it, we're buying it from them. About $7,000 net per ton for the wow. industry. So that's a big win for them. So it's hydrofluorosilicic acid out of the fertilizer stacks in, in southern states and China. And it also comes along with traces, not large amounts, but traces that bioaccumulate in the body of lead and mercury and arsenic and cadmium and strontium and bromium and all sorts of nasty things. Right. Trace elements, but those trace elements can make a difference to oh, a lot yeah. of people. Especially if, and a lot of people who follow my page on Kids Health Revolution are people who have kids that have chronic health concerns, and so those mm -hmm. trace elements are a, a big concern A lot of us. people can be very sensitive to those, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, so then the fluoride that they're getting from these fertilizer plants and, and proposing putting in the water, is it the same as the fluoride that somebody would get from their dentist or in their toothpaste? No. It is no. not even the same. That, that fluoride is, 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 has to be medically certified, it has to be clean and clear and all sorts of checks and balances. Whereas the hydrofluorosilicic acid that's scrubbed out of the fertilizer stacks comes straight from the stacks into a truck and into your water. Wow. That blows my mind. It should blow your mind because, that, I mean, if, if fluoride was deemed to actually be a medicine by the powers that be, if they admitted that it was a medicine, it would have to be cleaned and certified and it would never pass any of the regulations up there, the very strict regulations mm -hmm. for, uh, for a drug, for a, a supplement, for a health food, anything like that. It wouldn't right. pass any of those regulations. Right, wow. That's amazing to me. I knew it was different, but I didn't realize, you know, it was night and day different. And that's like 98% of the fluoride that's put into water in North America and Australia, hydrofluorosilicic wow. acid. Wow. So, not only is it a different, completely different compound, uh, we're putting it in the water, 99% of people don't even drink the water, it's just going back into the environment. Uh, and it's actually, yeah. it's not 99% of the people don't drink it, it's 99% doesn't get drunk. Doesn't get drunk, oh I see, okay, 99% of the water, tap water, doesn't get drunk. But there's okay. probably a pretty high percentage of people that don't drink the tap water anyway when it is fluoridated, so right. we don't have a percentage. Well even on now, that. like, I, I know, most of the people <clears throat> I know either filter their drinking water mm -hmm. anyway to get the taste of chlorine and stuff like that, or drink bottled water, you mm -hmm. know, they have the filters, the Stantivia filters mm -hmm. or whatever else, so I know a lot of people aren't actually drinking straight tap water as it is. Well, since uh, we took fluoride out in 2011, I've been drinking the tap water ever since. I filter yeah. a little bit here and there, but mostly yeah. it's right out of the tap, and right. I have no problem with that. As long as you let it sit for a couple of minutes, the chlorine, and, uh, chlorine basically evaporates and right. it's gone. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So you can get the filter sense. again if this happens, which it's not going to, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, so let's talk about uh, the cost for a second. So, you know, this is another big one. You know, when people hear about this, if they're not convinced by the, by the ethical side of it, of the mass medication, if they're not convinced by the fact that it's all based on, uh, you know, lies from a study mm -hmm. or sensationalism. Sensationalized. And all of this sort of stuff, then sometimes cost is what, you know, kind mm -hmm. of gets people. And right? actually that's part of how we won the day in 2011 is that several of the counselors were concerned about the economics of it. Right. It was gonna cost about $6 million to rebuild the infrastructure of the, uh, the two water plants in Calgary. Because uh, fluoride, uh, fluoride is so caustic, it eats away at metal, it eats away at wood, at concrete, virtually anything. So it really destroys the infrastructure quite quickly and it has to be replaced every several years. Mm -hmm. So it was going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 million to replace that. And then there's the uh, yearly cost, which the pro-fluoridationists say is about $750,000 per year in Calgary. It's probably a lot higher than that because they don't count in the, the training of all the personnel, the hazmat suits they have to wear to handle this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a whole lot of other factors that come into play too, but you know, let's say about a million dollars a year plus the uh, the cost of the infrastructure. So that was partly why it was defeated in 2011. Right. Interesting. So if it was six million to fix it all then, and we haven't been using it, it's going to be at least that much. To at least, fix it. at least that, if not more. Yeah. Right. And then the yearly cost on top yeah. of that. And they're already talking about increasing our taxes. So yeah. you know, where's the money for this going to come from? And the cost of fluoride and toothpaste is cheap. Uh, supplements are super cheap, with something like fifteen dollars a year if you want fluoride pills. Uh, wow. the, rent, the rinses and all that uh, are quite inexpensive as well. Uh, 
our dentists are very expensive in Calgary, so if you go to get your gels or combs or whatever at the dentist, that might cost a bit more. But um, that dental care is available for free for most of our core kids in Alberta. Okay, so that was going to be one of my questions, is what about a family that can't afford to maybe buy the supplements or the, the rinses or something for their family to use? Mm -hmm. there, there are options in place already. Mm -hmm. Uh, with our provincial government, with yes, provincial they provided government. that. Okay. You might have to do a little bit of digging to find that, but it is there. And also the Alex bus, um, the Alex dental bus out of Southeast Calgary, does a good job with a lot of the poor kids too. Okay. Travels around and treats them for free. Okay. Okay, so there are programs in place for people who want to access fluoride. Mm -hmm. uh, if they need it, they can, you know, buy it. And then there's programs in place for people to access it if economically that's just not viable. That's correct. So the argument that we have to put it in the water to help everybody or to help reach those people that want it and can't get it is really not. It's not a very effective argument. Right. right. Okay. Good. So uh, do we have any questions coming in Isela? So far just comments. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I know that we did have a question from before. Um, We've covered, so we talked a little bit, Dr. Bob, you talked about filtration, and I know we had a question before about the filtration. What was that? Yes, we have a question here. Um, somebody wanted to know how the fluoride would affect us when bathing or showering. Uh -huh. So bathing or showering um, is a concern. There is some absorbed through the skin, not near as much as it absorbed when you drink it or when you have it in your oral mucosa, but some is absorbed by the skin. Um, but the main problem is there's a, a, sub, a subgroup of people that are really allergic to it, they're really sensitive to it. So if their fluoride just touches their skin, they'll break out in blisters or reactions, hives, that sort of thing. Um, that's a smaller amount of people, but um, those people can't go anywhere near fluoride. So um, bathing and showering, yes, if you want to get rid of all the fluoride in your house in a fluoridated city, you have to get either a distillation system, which is super expensive and distilled water is not that great for you, right. or most people go with the reverse osmosis system for the whole house, which can cost anywhere from several, like three or 4,000 to 10 or 15,000 yeah. dollars for the whole house system. Yeah. I looked so, into a whole house system for our house, and it was going to be uh, $12,000. $12,000, yeah, that's, that's in the ballpark. So yeah. that's very expensive, and, and the poor people certainly can't afford to do that. They can't afford to take it out. Right. So if you're mass medicating, you're, you're subjecting a, a high percentage of the population to something that they just can't really avoid or remove. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can filter it out of your drinking water. It's harder to get it out of your bathing water. Mm -hmm. There is some absorption through the skin. You know, and let's face it, when we have a baby in the bathtub, um, how much water do they drink, right? Mm -hmm. When they're in the bathtub, usually quite a bit. So, you know, they're going to be getting exposed to that. And again, you know, for followers of Kids Health Revolution, we always talk about these different exposures. And even for us, like with my child, we filter the bath water just to take the chlorine out mm -hmm. uh, because of those sensitivities. When you have children whose bodies are already burdened and struggling with chronic illnesses, this is a concern, even the absorbing Absolutely. it through the skin, right? And we should probably just comment that the fridge filters and the Brita filters and all those, they don't touch fluoride. It's such a, a tiny, aggressive ion that it just doesn't touch them. So you do need a more expensive filter. Okay, interesting. And um, do we know like anything about um, how, because this, this compound is so different than, than the medical grade fluoride, mm -hmm. Um, once it gets into our water system and then starts, you know, getting watered onto our lawn and goes into our rivers and streams, do we have any sort of environmental information on what, you know, what that might look like and how long it would take for that to get taken care of? Yeah, as I mentioned, there are some studies coming out, but uh, the problem is when something like this uh, public health policy has been pushed for so many decades, uh, over seven decades now, there's just not a lot of money or not a lot of, not, lot of, not a lot of effort or stimulus to do the studies, to look at the, uh, at the repercussions or side effects or problems with it. But they're starting to come out now. And as I mentioned before, probably 0.5 parts per million is, is the most that should be put into our, our environment. And that leads to another thing too. Um, the prochloridationists often say, oh, we're just topping up the natural fluoride that's already in our, our rivers. 
And there is natural fluoride in all, virtually all the rock on our planet, really. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it gets into our, our water systems and our rivers and wells. But that's natural calcium fluoride. Mm -hmm. And calcium fluoride is tightly bound. That's why it's not ubiquitous as fluoride in the environment. It's calcium fluoride tightly bound. When we take that into our bodies, often it just passes out of the system just like it came in. Mm -hmm. And the fluoride ion is not released. Whereas with hydrofluorosilicic acid, as soon as it touches the water, the fluoride ion is released and it's totally available. That ion goes into your, your gut and it, it goes right through any of the gut membranes, into your, into your blood, into your system, goes to every cell, every organ, every system in the body, and it crosses the placental barrier if you're pregnant and you don't want fluoride in your unborn child's brain and body, yeah. but that, that placental barrier is to protect against toxins. The fluoride ion just bypasses that. And also, we have the blood-brain barrier that's to protect our sensitive brain from toxins and chemicals and other such things. Fluoride crosses the blood-brain wow. barrier just like that. And so that's why some that's of good. the newest studies that are coming out are showing that there's anywhere from a four to seven IQ point drop in areas that are fluoridated in young kids. So wow. we're damaging the brains yes. of our young kids to perhaps decrease one cavity or carry in a lifetime in permanent teeth. Wow. Is it worth it? Absolutely not. Even if that was the only thing it did, but it does other things too. It calcifies yeah. the pineal gland. It's a thyroid enzyme toxin. So anybody that has thyroid problems or is low in iodine, mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard on thyroid. It's very hard on kidneys. The Kidney Association of America has withdrawn their support of fluoridation. Well, that's interesting. Um, people that are on, have kidney disease or on dialysis can't go anywhere near fluoride. Right. Um, it's very hard on bone, it makes bones thicker, but uh, it interferes with the infrastructure of bone, so oh. it makes them thicker but more easy to fracture. So brittle. Brittle, exactly, okay. thank you. And um, one of the major problems I have with it is this. just this last year, the, the 2018 data out of the NHANES, the big population study in the United States that's 75% fluoridated, shows that over 60% of teens in North America have fluorosis, which is the early signs of toxicity and early signs of damage to teeth. So we're trying to fix teeth or decrease caries in teeth and we're actually damaging teeth in over 60% of the kids in heavily fluoridated US. And the people in Canada, the pro-fluoridation says, oh, it's, it's just a cosmetic thing, it's just strengthening the teeth. In the States now, that late, the latest information and studies show that 30% of those kids that are, uh, are fluorosed, have fluorosis, are in the moderate to severe range. And that means those teeth are permanently damaged and they need corrected to the tune of usually many thousands of dollars. Wow. Just as a quick antidote, one of my dental friends in downtown Calgary fixed the teeth of, um, of two boys that grew up during the fluoridated time in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately, they're from a wealthy oil patch family. And um, these two kids had moderate fluorosis and it cost them over $70,000 per child to fix that fluorosis damage. Wow. So even if you did save one cavity in a lifetime, and that's what, $100, $200 to fix at a dentist, but you've got fluorosis in 30% of those kids that needs tens of thousands of dollars of repair. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's just not economically viable to, no. Goodness to fluoridate. No. So, you know, not, not only is there consequences to the, to the teeth, but we're also talking about systemic consequences too, exactly. right? So cosmetic and you know problems that need to be fixed with the teeth, but then we've got these <clears throat> systemic problems that you mentioned, the thyroid, the kidneys. I think it's huge that the Kidney Foundation has withdrawn their support. And the Alzheimer's Association just this last year withdrew their support well, in the I was states too. Gonna say that that's really interesting. Because, New studies yeah. coming out, Alzheimer's disease is it's not caused by fluoride, no. but it's certainly exacerbated. exacerbated. We don't know how much because they don't do the studies uh, or very seldom. Um, ADHD is exacerbated or enhanced with fluoride right. um, and probably autism too. I mean, there's all kinds of things on the spectrum that are, are enhanced or, or harmed or yeah. um, increased or whatever by fluoride. Right. Well, if it's crossing the blood brain barrier, and I know that a mm -hmm. lot of people, you know, that I connect with on Kids Health Revolution have kids with neurological conditions. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so, you know, we talk a lot about the blood brain barrier and, you know, when the blood brain barrier becomes a, a little bit leaky. So for these yeah. kids, it's even worse. Exactly. Right? Their brains can be flooded with this stuff, causing yeah. all kinds of inflammation and problems. And the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious journals in the planet, in 2015 deemed fluoride as a potent neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. So it's slightly less toxic than ar arsenic, but more toxic than lead. So wow. it's way up there on the toxic scale. Wow. So yeah, just let's just throw it in the water and uh, and then have people take it for the rest of their life without ever monitoring or following up and without informed consent because we never tell. A lot of people don't even know no. there's fluoride in their water I know. or not. It, or not, yeah. yeah. Or that this is even up for discussion in front of our council yeah. at the moment. That's what's so frightening to me is it seems mm -hmm. to be almost happening, or I could be wrong, but it's almost like it's trying to happen behind closed doors in a way. It's not totally closed doors, but it is very sort of subterfuge. Uh, right. It's not publicized, it's not uh, really topical, but right. it should be. It should be, more people. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, not that any mainstream news media is watching my videos, but <laughs> if you do, I'm going to throw down the gauntlet for you and say, you know, you guys need to do some actual investigative reporting here and not just... Well, that's that's a huge request because is it? Uh, media we probably get between um, uh, maybe one to five or ten um, pro fluoride pieces in in the mainstream media. Right. Um, so if, if you're out um, if you're out publicized ten to one, it's pretty hard to combat. Yes, I suppose that's true. So we'll have to re we'll have to rely on the grassroots movement, mm -hmm. I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you for doing this. Yeah, yeah, no worries. One thing I'd like to touch on is, is dose and dosage Please, too. We mentioned yeah. that just briefly yeah. before, but I think that's an important point because particularly dentists and doctors should be looking at that. And every time we ask the profluoridationist about dose or dosage, you just say, "Oh, that's okay. We've we've, we've uh, we're managing the concentration, so it's not a concern." So they've lowered the concentration of fluoride from 1.2 parts per million about a decade or two ago to uh, one part per million, then to 0.8 parts per million, and now it's 0.7 parts per million. Yeah. Trust us, safe and effective. 1.2 to 0.7, that's about a 40% decrease if my mm -hmm. math is okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, But it still was safe and effective at 1.2, and now it's safe and effective at only 0.7. Um, they're not really sure really what safe and effective is. Actually, safe and effective is zero. Yeah. Uh, but um, dose and dosage are important because um, say we have a, a hundred pound woman who's running marathons and she's drinking 10 glasses of fluoridated water a day. Mm. I'm sitting in my office and I'm busy, I only have time to drink one glass of fluoridated water, but I weigh 200 pounds, twice as much as this, this young woman that's drinking the 10 glasses. So right away, she's drinking 10 glasses to my one, so she's getting 10 times the dose of fluoride. Yeah. But dosage is the amount of drug per kilogram of weight right. so she is getting actually 20 times the dosage that i'm getting okay. because she's half the weight so twice as much dosage dosage 20 so, times and again speaking of this like a medication mm -hmm. this would be like taking 20 times sure some other medication that you might be yep. prescribed yeah if i said to take 400 milligrams of ibuprofen twice a day um, and would you take 4,000 milligrams twice a day? No, probably not. You probably wouldn't live very long. Yeah. Which brings me to another point. The prochloridations are often quoted in the mainstream press, uh, on uh, radio and TV shows, and uh, in uh, the newspapers and whatever. Oh, I could drink 10 to 15 swimming pools worth of fluoride, or I could drink 30 gallons worth of fluoride. They could, but they wouldn't live very long. Right. They'd be dead fairly soon. So, yeah, and, so and, and then they say after that, us. after that they say, and we wouldn't have any side effects. Well, they're right there. They wouldn't have any side effects because they'd be dead. Right. <laughs> there you go. I guess you yeah. could call death a side effect. Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah. Anyway, I wish they quit saying that because it's totally untrue and it's very misleading to people. Because yeah. again, they're just trying to rubber stamp this safe and effective. Safe, safe, safe and effective. Right. And that comes to another point. The reason why they can say safe and effective and there's no studies out there against fluoridation is every time a study comes up, they hit the delete button. Right. And they deleted like two, three thousand studies that are anti fluoride, and they could just delete, 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 and then they say, no studies no against studies. fluoride. Mm -hmm. Okay, quit hitting the delete button, folks, because there's some darn good studies right. that have come up recently. Like okay. the one out of Mexico that was actually done in conjunction with the University of Toronto, Dr. Wu, and University of Michigan, funded by the National Institute of Health out of the, out of the States, and done on pregnant women in Mexico City. Oh. A very, very good study in 2017. Mm -hmm. And it showed that, um, that, that's the one that showed between four and seven IQ points drop 
and their kids. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So is most is is this a little bit like the you know sort of the Monsantos and things like that? Is most of the uh, pro fluoride supportive research coming sort of funded through industry and people who stand to gain from? A lot of it is. A lot of that was done in the old days. There's not much. Uh, there's yeah. not many studies that come out now. Are you familiar with the Cochrane collaboration? I've heard it. I'm not super familiar. Uh, Cochrane is uh, is the most esteemed organization on the planet to. Uh, to assess drugs and treatments and therapies okay. and things in the medical world. And they did, a, in 2015, did a big study on water fluoridation. And the Cochrane Collaboration found that uh, there was only about 19 studies that were anywhere near viable. They weren't good high-grade studies, but they were okay. Mm -hmm. And only three of those were done since 1975. Wow. Now, since 1975, we've had a lot more right. fluoride and toothpaste and a lot more dental treatments yeah. and better diets and all those things, which has contributed to cavities and caries. If you look at the cavities and caries, say, in the 1950s, and then you follow that down to the 2000s, they've gone down markedly mm. in every country in the world, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're fluoridated or, or not. not. The same way, they all come down the same way. Mm -hmm. So water fluoridation has had nothing to do with that, but the pro-fluoridationists often take credit for that. Okay. Oh, look, in our country, um, caries came down. Well, they came down in anyway. European countries, mm -hmm. and, which brings me to another important point. Uh, we're made to feel in Calgary like we're the outliers, that we're the rebels, that we did something wrong by stopping well, fluoridation in 2011. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we? Well, actually, 95% of the world is not fluoridated. 97% really? of Europe is not fluoridated. They're mm -hmm. often more progressive than us. Yes. There's fluoridated salt available in some of those countries, but yeah. that's choice. 98% right. um, of Quebec is not fluoridated. Their teeth are actually reasonably good. 98% of British Columbia, right next door to us, mm -hmm. not fluoridated. And they often boast in British Columbia of having some of the best dental and teeth. kids' health in, yeah. in Canada. Yeah. And guess what? The pro fluoridations are even trying to fluoridate all of British Columbia. Wow. Amazing. Uh, it just boggles my mind. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to double check on how we're doing with time. Time check, what time it's is it? It's 10 p.m. Okay, so uh, I have a couple more questions I want to make sure that I get to with you. Okay. And before I do that, I want to make sure that I mention, uh, we will be posting, and I'm not sure if Maria's already done it, links uh, to the Safe Water Calgary uh, website where you can get more information. And as well, please, 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 if you're listening to this and it's resonating with you, take a minute to go to the petition that will be in the comments and sign that petition because yes, there indeed. is something that we can do about this. We just need our voices to be heard. And the more people that join together and say, I'm concerned about this, the better, the stronger position we have to take in front of council and say, Calgarians don't want this. And email your aldermen, your councillors, yes. please. Yes, and on the Safe Water Calgary uh, Facebook, as well as the website, They've laid it all out there for you. Maria's amazing in everything she's done mm -hmm. there. She's got everybody's email address. She's even got a template there for you. If you don't have time to like figure out what you want to say in the email, just copy paste it in there and send it off. The more voices that are heard in this, even if you have, after listening to this, a shadow of a doubt, as they say, if you're on a jury in a trial, if you have a shadow of a doubt in your mind about whether you think that this is a good idea or not, isn't it better to err on the side of caution? Mm -hmm. Throw your name on that p p petition and, and let's put a stop to this. The precautionary principle. If you're in doubt, don't do it. Right. And also as a physician, first of all, do no harm. Right on. Yeah. yeah. But we should be dealing. We talked about it just a little bit earlier about the poor kids. We should be doing something for the poor kids. But unfortunately, those affected most by the side effects of fluoridation and of overdosing fluoride are the fetus, babies, children, the poor, mm -hmm. people of color, the disadvantaged, chronically ill people, and the elderly. Right. That's a pretty large subgroup of people, people there. Not even a subgroup. Really. Yeah, I heard you. I mean, it's probably the majority when you get right down to it. Yeah. So what can we do for the poor kids? If fluoride doesn't work for them, and it's, it's going to be causing more harm, obviously, than, than good. any good it might do, yeah. what can we do for them? Well, I think, and I've been asking council for the last two or three years, we should be at least forming a pilot program that's similar or modeled on the Child Smile program out of Scotland. 
Scotland has zero fluoridation, zero water fluoridation, yeah. and they have some of the best kids' teeth on the planet yeah. because in 2001 they started a program that starts with little kids that can walk under this table, the two and three year olds, yeah. and then it teaches them not only about tooth health, but about oral health mm -hmm. and about total body health. So their rates of childhood diabetes and obesity are far decreased, their oral health and teeth health is much better, mm -hmm. and they don't use any fluoride. Wow. Why can we not do that here? Right. Why has the O'Brien Institute of Public Health in the last eight years since we stopped water fluoridation in Calgary not come up with a program like that? Instead, they just sit back and go, safe and effective, let's fluoridate the water and save the world. Mm -hmm. uh, like that sort of magic bullet approach. Right. And this magic bullet doesn't work. It's a failed public health initiative. Right, and which is evidenced by the fact that, what, what was your number, 95% of the world? Doesn't fluoridate. Doesn't fluoridate. Yeah. And yeah. We're in the majority. Right. <laughs> We're actually with the, yeah. the vast majority of the world. Yeah. So we need to sort of take the blinders off now, exactly. right? And say there's better ways to take care of our kids. Much to better. More cost effective ways to take care and of our kids. And it might cost a little bit to get those programs going, started. but once they're started, the costs go down and down, and the kids' health gets better and better. Right. Because it's not only about their teeth health, then, it's all about overall health. Exactly. Right? Right, which is decreasing the pressure on our medical system. Which saves a huge amount right. of money down if the we're, road. If we're yeah. decreasing type 2 diabetes in kids, then that's saving a lot of money. Exactly. Right. Right. Okay, good. So, sign that petition. <laughs> it's in the comments. Make sure you go and do that. So, uh, anything else that you want to make sure that we touch on? Just a couple of quick things. Okay. Um, medicine by plebiscite is not a good thing. I should not be voting as to what medication you should take, and you shouldn't be voting as to what medication I should take. Uh, okay. So some counselors, I uh, won't mention any names, but they're pushing for a plebiscite in, 2000, in 2021 okay. with the next election. Medicine by plebiscite is not a good way to practice mm -hmm. medicine. So um, it should be decided now, and we should take it out and leave it out forever and ever. Right on. Okay. And so people can help with that by doing what we've talked about. Anything mm -hmm. else that they can do? Um, yeah, like work with us, come out and volunteer with us. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to really get the word out in a grassroots kind of way uh, yeah. with plebiscites, plebiscites online, sign up for that, but also uh, probably plebiscites on paper. We're going to have to do some work on that too. Yes, yeah, exactly. But it takes a lot of um, a lot work. work. Yeah. Person, person work, person work. Person work, yes, then. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Feminist. Um, um, okay, so I want to touch just really quickly before we finish up on. Uh, you know, part of what we hear from council is that they're they're investigating this, and they have an expert panel that's going to you know inform them so they mm -hmm. can make an informed decision. So the talk to me about that. The expert, expert panel. panel that is um, all pro fluoride. They're out of the O'Brien Institute of Public Health at the University of Calgary. Virtually every one of them is, I would say rapidly pro fluoride okay. and uh, so this is the expert panel it's like going to it's, it's, if you wanted to know things about the carbon tax so would you go to the the UCP and to uh, Doug Ford's government in Ontario and ask him to do an expert review of the carbon tax right I wouldn't right. I, would, I would get some neutral people to do that right. the Bryan Institute is not neutral right. or at least uh, have somebody from both sides exactly yeah right. at least have some balance there yeah. yeah yeah so if you want pro fluoridation is there you got to have some some safe water people or anti fluoridationists on the other side, right. but they fought really hard to sideline me mm -hmm. and uh, and to um, really keep some very uh, smart and uh, knowledgeable dentists off that um, committee as well. Okay. So um, it, it, it's I can t I, I could have told you an hour after that um, uh, the approval was given by City Council for the O'Brien Institute to do that study and report back in June. I could have told you an hour after virtually exactly what that report is going to say. Right. It's going to say, let's fluoridate, folks, because it's safe and effective. Safe and effective. Mm -hmm. Safe and effective. <laughs> so um, you were really involved in this in 2011. You were invited to the table mm -hmm. in 2011. Is that right? There wasn't really a table. It was uh, open uh, debate at City Council. Okay. Yeah. So we all, we all did presentations there. The okay. pro, the pro and the anti the right sides. Okay. But there was no expert panel in 2011. It was public consultation. Okay. This year, you've actually been shut out of the process, oh, is yeah. that correct? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. So that's one of the obstacles you've come up against. Is there any other sort of obstacles or repercussions you've faced for, for the, the 
stance you've taken on this? Well, actually, the, the folks at the O'Brien Institute have put a couple of complaints into the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Alberta against me, and um, again, trying to marginalize or sideline me and make sure I'm not called an expert. Right. Um, the college has dismissed uh, that uh, complaint, the first complaint so far, and they've appealed that dismissal. Um, so wow. they're trying to make life difficult for me. Wow. Um, it's not going to keep me quiet. Uh, yeah. I, I know I'm speaking the truth, and uh, yeah. I'm not going to back down, no matter what the repercussions that uh, that they can bring that against they try me. To throw at you. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's You're hard. For that. Yeah. It is difficult. Uh, a lot of careers have been destroyed along the way. Uh, my good friend Dr. Hardy Lineback, who is the former head of uh, preventative dentistry at the University of Toronto, he came out about the same time I did and said that um, actually I've been studying this for decades and I found out that fluoride is not safe and effective. And his career from that point on was hell. Um, it was essentially destroyed and he retired early in 2012 because of the way he was hounded and denigrated and the pejorative things that were said to him personally in the press, right across the board. Mm -hmm. They made life very difficult for him as they had for, uh, for many researchers in the states that have lost their funding when they came out and said that water fluoridation is not a good thing. Yeah. So that's why a lot of the dentists, like people say, well every dentist in Calgary will tell you fluoride's good for you. Mm -hmm. Well that's not true, a lot of dentists out there uh, will, will tell you personally that it's mm -hmm. not uh, fluoride is not good, but right. they won't speak out publicly uh -huh. because the Alberta Dental Association has sanctioned them, has right. literally shut them down. Yeah. And they've said to him, okay, you can speak out about fluoride, we'll take your license away and you won't have a career, but speak out all you want. But carry on, yeah. yeah. Well, who's gonna let their very high salary in their dental practice well, yes. go to After speak out against fluoride? After all the studying they've done, and yeah. yeah, everything they put in. And you know, as you say, I find this just so heartbreaking because you know, you said it, first do no harm, mm -hmm. right? And and when you're speaking out actively about something like that, that you are following that oath, mm -hmm. you know, to its word, and then, you know, you kind of get, you know, really slapped for right. it. And I think that that's really, really sad and unfortunate. And I'm so glad that you're willing to share that because I think it's important that people know that that's going on behind the scenes. Do we have time for one quick analogy? Uh, of course, there? you betcha. Um, so. I'll mention her name. It's Dr. Sarah Holland. She's um, she speaks out a lot in, on the um, radio and TV and whatever. Uh, in 2010, when we were still fluoridated in Calgary, she was on CBC Radio and uh, said that we have an epidemic of pediatric dental caries in Calgary, and it's because um, poor dental care, lack of um, flossing, lack of toothbrushing. Um, you know, not enough calcium in the diet, not enough vitamin D, she had too much sugar, the sugary drinks, mm -hmm. you know, just a bad diet. She, yeah. she came up with all the things that are causing this uptick we have now right. in fluoridated and unfluoridated cities. It doesn't matter, there is an uptick yeah. in, in pediatric dental caries. And so uh, she said epidemic, and it's because of all those, those reasons, she was totally right. Yeah. In 2013, two years after we uh, stopped fluoridation, she was on CBC Radio again, same mm -hmm. person, we have an epidemic of pediatric dental caries, and it's because we stopped fluoridation in 2011. I'm mm. going, Sarah, hold it here. Mm. Was, <laughs> didn't you just say that, <laughs> you know, mm. you can see the problem we're up what against there. What happened there, there yeah. And when a pediatric dentist with credibility on public radio says, we have an epidemic of pediatric dental caries because we stopped fluoridation, what is the press report? Exactly that. that. Is it true? Absolutely not. I have a whole lot of dentists that will say, they really haven't seen any change, or maybe a slight uptick, but uh, yeah. there's certainly not an epidemic since we stopped water fluoridation. Right. That is not proven in a study. There's actually never been any study in the world, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled study done anywhere in the world right. on water fluoridation. Well, never. it would be such a tricky thing to do, too, because as you say, there's so it's many confounding factors. problematic, it, it is, but it can be done. There, there's be done. certain ways it could be done. Yeah. But they don't want to because they right. know it wouldn't show. Of course, the what they wanted to show. Yeah. 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 They'd have a hard time manipulating that one. Right. Interesting. Okay. So, do we have any other questions coming in over here? We had some questions and we had some comments that uh, perhaps would be worthwhile to mention. Okay. And maybe Dr. Nixon wants to respond to them. Sure. So, uh, just some simple questions first here. People were asking <laughs> about uh, the type of filters that they could use. Um, if water is fluoridated, if you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Well, as we mentioned before, it's reverse osmosis is, is the primary one. You can get a, a less expensive reverse osmosis uh, system to put under your sink, yeah. um, but you have to change those filters every six months, every year or two, and they're expensive. Um, or the whole house reverse osmosis system, as we mentioned, for like 10 or so thousand dollars. Uh, the Berkey filter is a portable one that you can have sitting on your counter that is actually quite effective, the Berkey. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of others that take a considerable amount of fluoride out. There's very little that takes everything out. So the best um, the best way to filter your water is to not put fluoride in to start with. I like that. Yeah. Right, because what about the bathing water, right? We talked yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. So here is a comment uh, a comment from so, a lady. Maria, for just one quick sec before mm -hmm. before we go to the next one, you know, I want to say I, I get I get the the question because it's something on everybody's mind. You know, we go, oh my God, what am I going to do if they pass this? Well, okay. If we get there, then we're going to deal with that. But let's not get there. Yeah. Let's get involved so we don't get there, right? Yeah. And what I used to do with my clinic and, and at home when we were fluoridated is just order the big bottles from a very good Calgary company that they had no fluoride in it. Right. And so they deliver a couple of bottles to my home and five or six to my clinic every couple of weeks. And right. uh, we used a very good quality um, filtered oh. water from, from a Calgary company. Right. But we shouldn't have to be doing that. Our no, tap water should. should be drinkable. Again, it comes down to that choice piece, mm -hmm. right? Okay, next, next one. Yes, so I'm um, just going to mention first names because we want yep. to respect people's privacy here on a live video uh, broadcasting in a lot of places. So there is a lady of name Juliet mm -hmm. who uh, mentions that uh, she thinks serious people monitor public health measures. She mentions that Dr. Dixon is not qualified to speak about this issue because you're a family physician and not a medical officer of health. The public agency of the, the sorry, the public health agency of Canada has affirmed that fluoridation is safe. Any comments to that? Um, okay, I guess I don't have a public health degree or qualification. I do have a medical degree. I have a degree in kinesiology as well. And I've studied this uh, subject of fluoridation extensively for the last two decades. I've gone through studies that uh, the pro-fluoridationists at the University of Calgary probably haven't even heard of. Um, so um, my uh, expertise in water fluoridation, I put up against any of those members of the O'Brien Institute. I uh, will put it out publicly right now that I'll debate any one of those people or any group uh, of them at any given time, uh, anywhere in the public or privately. Um, because uh, my knowledge of water fluoridation is greater than that of any of those people at the um, O'Brien Institute of Public Health. Would you say that regardless of your medical qualifications, you also ha have uh, the right to express your personal opinion as somebody who has personally researched this topic? Absolutely, whether I'm a doctor or not, I've researched this so much that uh, my knowledge is quite extensive on water fluoridation. And I've also liaised with some of the top experts on the planet, with toxicologists, with PhDs, with researchers, with other doctors, with uh, dentists, dentist PhDs that are strongly against fluoridation. There's thousands and thousands of uh, professionals out there that are against water fluoridation. But again, not all will, are willing to speak out because of the ways that uh, many careers have been affected or destroyed. And the way that they're challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the same person actually made a comment about the studies that are anti-fluoride often being conducted outside of North America and not uh, being relevant or, or having some uh, metho uh, methodological, sorry, I can't talk today, problems. So problems in the methodology used to, to conduct the study. So do you have any comments about that? Well, virtually every study on the planet has flaws and problems. Um, the Public Health, uh, Public Health Ontario actually put down that study that I mentioned, the Bashash study from 2017, and saying, well, it's not really relevant to Canadian women. Well, just last year, a year after that study came out, Dr. Christine Till did a study of uh, pregnant women in Canada and found that in fluoridated cities, their uh, urine fluoride concentration was twice as much as women in non-fluoridated, pregnant women in non-fluoridated cities. So um, it doesn't matter how you get your fluoride. That, that's one of the reasons why Public Health Ontario kind of put that study aside because they were only commenting on water fluoridation. Well, that study isn't relevant because they use fluoridated salt. What do you mean it's not relevant? It's the, the, the fluoride that's in the system. It doesn't matter how it gets there. It's the amount of fluoride that's in your system. 
And um, that study was, uh, I think, very well done. Few minor flaws here and there, yes, but it's shown that pregnant women have twice the level of uh, fluoride in their systems and that their babies, because it crosses the placental barrier, their babies have high levels in their brains and other parts of their body and IQs are being dropped by several points. Sure, there's studies in China that have higher levels of natural fluoride in their water, but some of those studies from China uh, have the same level that we have and some have maybe five or ten times higher. So there's a whole range of studies out of China. Uh, almost every one of them show neurological damage. So, that, uh, you know, thank you for that response. And I'm really curious as to why we would throw out research that's done in other countries just because it's not done in North America. I, I, mm -hmm. I find that to be an interesting A bit arrogant, I would think. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, she does mention that she thinks that uh, North American uh, Seed health is great, and that there's no problems. But we heard some statistics about fluorosis amongst teens, so mm -hmm. I wonder about that. Uh, um, there is. Uh, just comment on that. I think Donald sure. Trump has, must have built a wall on the Canada-U.S. border because there's 30% moderate to severe fluorosis in U.S. and then right across the border in Canada there's hardly any. So I'm not quite sure. Well, actually, I do know how that happens. In Ontario, they look for fluorosis in kids that are three and four years old. But they don't have fluorosis because they don't have their permanent teeth yet, and the permanent teeth are where we, we see fluorosis. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, we say in medicine, if, if, you don't, um, if you don't look for, if you don't take a temperature, you won't find a fever. Right, exactly. Yeah. You don't look for, for fluorosis where it's going to occur, you won't find You're not any fluorosis. Find it. Okay, any other comments from anybody? Besides, yes, that's this right. Lady. Perhaps <laughs> from this lady, there is a lady. Her name is Wendy, and she says, uh, "To error in the on the side of caution, children with severe dental decay are in constant pain. How does a child in pain learn at school? Eat food that is nutritious and get adequate sleep. Read the CAD report before making a decision." So she's saying that uh, she thinks um, fluoridating the water is. Um, is a good idea perhaps. The officers for public health are the specialists of medicine that should be that should be making public health decisions, she adds. Mm -hmm. Any comments about that? Well, um, it, it's, it's really painful to watch these kids that have so many cavities and caries, but water fluoridation, if we had it or not, would not make any difference. I mean, maybe half a cavity, maybe one cary in these kids' permanent teeth, it's not going to make a difference for these kids. We have to get to their diets, we have to get to their dental care, we have to do things that actually make a difference. Water fluoridation is not a magic bullet. It's not something that's going to make a difference to these poor kids that are having so many problems and having to have painful dental surgeries and having uh, so many problems to, to eat and uh, to get proper nutrition. We need something like the Child Smile program that I mentioned before, and we could actually make a difference in these kids rather than relying on this single, easy, silver bullet approach of water fluoridation. Yes, and there is a comment here from Jeff, who actually says, in that sort of, uh, following that line of thought, what about people with kidney disease? What about people that can't filter the fluoride from the body, from the water, sorry? It's the people that are, that are most fragile, that are most affected, generally speaking, by uh, the side effects of fluoride. So as I mentioned before, it's the chronically ill, it's babies, it's the fetus, it's uh, young children that are get, getting overdosed and getting fluorosis that have, are actually destroying some of their teeth, um, brain damage. I mean, even if it did work, why would you risk brain damage and bone damage and kidney damage and uh, all these side effects, thyroid problems? It's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and a lot of people are commenting that they uh, just don't think that uh, a one-size-fits-all is the right way to go. Absolutely. If these public health people want to put uh, medicines in the water, let's put uh, Lipitor, you know, let's put anti-cholesterol drugs and antipsychotics and antidepressants in the water too. Oh, no, well, no, yeah, no, 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 no don't not. give them ideas. Just, no, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just using that as a bad analogy, <laughs> but uh, I mean, and, and again, it's like um, we don't we don't drink our, our sunscreen, we don't drink our mouthwash, we swish and spit out, we put the sunscreen on our skin. 
Fluoride is effective topically. It's not effective swallowed. So why would we swallow it when we can, when we can put it on our teeth where it has the most has the most potential to do good. I don't even think really it does a lot of good topically, and there's some more studies coming out. Actually, uh, if, if you look at the places that have the worst cavities and caries and poor areas in the states, it's in the poorest states that are heavily fluoridated for the longest period of time. Yeah. They have the worst dental health in the poor areas. Right. So right there, that's showing that fluoridation is not working for the poor kids. Right. It's not. It's not the food deserts and all yeah. of that stuff. And the, 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 and the sugary drinks. Yeah. And they also have in those same states, those poorest states in the U.S. that are heavily fluoridated, they also have the highest edentulous rate, or the, the loss of teeth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's because some studies are just coming out now that fluoride is interfering with the um, inflammatory cascade and it may cause more inflammation in the gums mm -hmm. and cause more periodontitis and gingivitis, which causes a lot of and then that affects the heart. It can affect everything in the body. Right. So the fluoride, it's on its way out, folks. It's more and more studies coming out, so we, <laughs> why should we put it back in Calgary? Right, and spend all the money, and then it's on the way out, and you know, five mm -hmm. years, you know, hopefully it doesn't go there, but then, you know, then five years from now, they're gonna go, whoops. Yeah, whoops. And mm -hmm. we've spent all of this money and time, and, yeah. and everybody's bought all their filters for the doomsday, and, and then we're just gonna take it out. And just to comment on, on these, all these expert panels and all these reports that are supporting fluoride, like the Australian report from 2017, the Health Canada report, uh, the Cadath report uh, that just came out here recently in February. Um, this report that's coming from the O'Brien Institute to City Council is just going to be a condensation of the Cadath report which is a, a, not a government organization, it's an arm's length organization, and it's done by pro-fluoridationists. So if I did a Cadeth report, or if my um, uh, anti-fluoridation or safe water colleagues, the experts out there on toxicology and research, did a Cadeth report, it would say fluoride is done, it's the end, and you know, we're never going to put this in anybody's water ever again. The Cadeth report that we're going to see is done by pro-fluoridationists, and it is totally biased, and it's highly flawed, and that's going to be the essence of the report that goes to the Calgary Council in June. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to share that uh, some people are saying thank you for sharing this in information, like Diana said, um, that uh, it's great to be educated and to learn this and so that people can make an informed decision about uh, what type of opinion they can share with council. So thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. And so any, any closing comments or remarks, things that you'd like to leave with people, Dr. Bob? Sure. Fluoride, and particularly water fluoridation, is not safe, it's not effective, it's not ethical, and it's not necessary for a single body function. Water fluoridation, don't swallow it. I like it. Where, I where's like a little bumper sticker? Oh, and here's another one. Fluoride, not, <laughs> not in, in my water. water. I like not it. in mine. So make sure you guys love the comments, even the comments that are asking questions. It's all good. Discussion is good. Talking about this is good. Getting it out into the open is good. If you have that shadow of a doubt, then do your research. Click on the links that are in the comments. Go and sign the petition until we get more information about this. And of course, you can also help by sharing this video. The more you share this, the more people we can get this out to in Calgary, the better because we need people to understand what's going on mm -hmm. kind of almost sort of behind closed doors so that you know we have a say in what's happening to us and in what goes into our bodies and our families' bodies that's all this is about so thanks everybody for tuning in thanks for your comments if you have any further questions type them in later video will always be there we'll scroll through periodically and see if we can answer any of them and, and that's thank it. you yeah Great awesome. job. Right, thank you much appreciated okay bye everybody i'm gonna yeah. now get up and turn off the camera <laughs> right bye everyone i think oh here we are